reason why Eugene Debs is is as uh, big of a figure as he is is because uh, Debs was an American socialist. Um, that he, he he ran under the Socialist Party of America. How many people even knew that? How many people knew that we had a viable Socialist Party in America in the early 1900s? They do not teach that in schools. They don't bring that up, right? They don't, they don't talk about that. They're like, no, there were the Democrats and the Republicans, and there's never been anything more than two parties. There was one party, and then it became the two parties. At one point, somebody called themselves the Whigs. That happened for a bit, uh, and that's it. That's, there's never been anything else ever in America. It's always been two parties because people have either believed in this way or that way, and that's it. That's the whole totality of human thought is this way or that way, and that's how we're taught American history to be, you know, which is ridiculous. Uh, because there have been um, various different third parties that have popped up all throughout American history, and a lot of them have have done pretty pretty damn good for themselves. Um, but Eugene Debs particularly, uh, and he had a really interesting point uh, point of view in terms of socialism, because he believed in revolutionary socialism, which we're going to get to. We're going to talk about that. Um, but let's talk about how he arrived to that conclusion. Let's talk about what led him to, to, to believe in this revolutionary socialism and what that actually means. Let's, let's, so we'll start in 1884. That's when we're going to start. In 1884, uh, Eugene Debs, Eugene Victor Debs, was elected into the Indiana House of Representatives. Uh, he was a young first-year um, uh, representative uh, from Terre Haute, Indiana. And, uh, and he was also uh, a union leader. He was the leader of the Brotherhood uh, of Locomotive Firemen. He was a union leader. That's what gave him a lot more political clout. And, and that's sort of how he um, led in the House of Representatives. He introduced a ton of bills. He introduced a bunch of bills um, you know, that specifically uh, revolved around regulating big businesses in Indiana. How are we going to regulate these big industries so that they don't get too big, so that they don't start taking advantage of the worker in, in any, you know, um, any exploitative manners? Um, if that sounds familiar, that's kind of what Bernie Sanders did with our Congress. Uh, being a democratic socialist independent within, um, within the American political system. Um, and you know, let, we're going to keep moving forward with, with that. Now, I wanted to make that connection there, right? Uh, what, what Debs is doing in the Indiana House of Representatives is essentially very similar to what Bernie Sanders is doing um, in the Senate. Um, he's an outsider. He's an outsider in what he believes in. Same with Debs. Debs was also an outsider in what he believes in, but he put forward a bunch of the stuff. He put forward a bunch of legislation in order to do that, right? And he led... Um, he led two different committees that specifically dealt with um, uh, the railroads and corporations uh, that, that, that re in, in terms of regulating them. He led these committees. Um, and he worked to get protections specifically for railroad families. That was one of the things that he uh, uh, paved the way on. He paved the way um, in protecting families uh, of workers that worked on the railroad. Uh, because he, what, again, this was kind of touched upon in, in your history classes, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I do remember m when I was going through school that they talked about the, you know, the, the railroads being a really tough job. They were a really dangerous job. Um, so there was a lot of injuries. There was a lot of death. And when these employees died when these workers died the families were basically left to fend for themselves they were basically left in financial ruin and the way that these corporations got around it was they said well it's not our fault you know what the job is you know how dangerous it is it's the co-workers fault go go haggle it out with them right so they tried to like pit people against each other essentially by saying that <coughs> if it wasn't for 
if it wasn't for the person standing next to the your your husband, um, he wouldn't have died. So you got to go talk to that family if you want restitution, if you want financial help in any 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 sort of way. Um, so Deb saw all this stuff happening, and he was like, "Well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like it's the right way to go about doing something like this." So he wrote various bills pushing for uh, particularly financial help uh, for these working class families, um, especially especially if you lose somebody, especially if your husband dies on the job, right? He, he wrote, like, he wrote, I think it's like House Bill 92, which specifically stated that the corporation should provide some kind of financial benefit um, to families that have seen injuries on the job or debts on the job. Uh, and he fought for employee protections. That's that's what he fought for. And the way that he made it work was he he tried to just appeal to humanity, right? One of the things this is this is what he said on the House floor. He said, "I want I want to have it so that when an employee of a railway is hurt through the negligence of a co-laborer or of the company, he may have redress from the company. The traveling public is protected." The employees should also have redress. I appeal on behalf of engineers, firemen, and the brakemen for this bill. So he basically straight up said, look, people that ride the rails get protected. Shouldn't the people that work on the rails also have some kind of protection to make sure that if they get hurt, that the company will take care of them, the company that they have given their labor to, that they have, that, that they have worked so damn hard for, um, and unanimously in the House, it got passed. Nobody opposed it. When he made that argument in the House of Representatives in Indiana, nobody opposed it. Everybody was on board with it. And then it got to the Senate. It got to the, it, it got to the Indiana Senate. Everybody ignored it. Nobody wanted to talk about it, and it died. And this happens all the time. This happens all the time, right? This is, this is what happens in our in our giant congress now you know not not a state level thing the federal level congress this happens in you got mitch mcconnell blocking bills left and right that's that's basically what his job is he's the bill blocker he's like oh people want protections fuck that shit i got a turtle shell i gotta hide in then he just tucks himself into his suit and it you know turns into a a tur that this he's like the if he's not even a nin like he's not a ninja like he's he's the worst form of like mutant turtle uh you could possibly imagine like he's been mutated by corruption so he's like the worst kind <laughs> and so i mean so this bill just it didn't happen so the workers that would get hurt that would die their families don't have anything to you know so so why would you work for a railroad company if the railroad company isn't going to help you out you know if if the if the nature of these corporations of the workforce itself is so callous and so uncompassionate to somebody giving their life up for your company then you can't take care of their like you can't give anything back to their family after they've lost a loved one And, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of people that are like, don't politicize the debt. Well, what the fuck? You're going to have to do something. The company's not going to do it on their own fucking regard. So now we have to make a law that, that legislates compassion. You shouldn't have to legislate compassion. That should just be a thing that happens. Uh, but corporations aren't really particularly known for their compassion. So after serving for one year... He served for one year. That was enough for him to see how corrupt this two-party system is. And at this point, Debs is a Democrat, too. Debs ran as a Democrat uh, for the House of Representatives in Indiana. He won, and he left. He, he saw how corrupt and broken the system was, that these senators that let this bill die were, were you know, uh, big supporters of, of the rail companies, they uh, either that or they were they were getting paid off by the la uh, the rail companies and um, 
And he left. And then he also left the Democratic Party in doing so. And and this is this is where I think the difference of Eugene Debs and Bernie Sanders goes. Um, is two times now Bernie Sanders has run within the Democratic Party in hopes that he can drive change from within. Eugene Debs saw it in one year, in one year of serving in the Indiana Congress as a state representative. And within that year, he saw exactly how corrupt it was, exactly how broken the system was, and said, I can't reform it from within. And I got to get the fuck out of here. Bernie Sanders is still playing that game. Which is unfortunate because I like Bernie. I'm a I'm a I'm a Bernie guy, you know. Um, I, I felt the burn in 2016. I felt the burn in 2020. Now I'm left singed, you know. I'm left singed. That's that's what I am. I got a I got a couple of third degree burns. The there was backdraft that happened, and uh, this time around there was a backdraft that came back at, at at us, at the working class people, at the supporters of the Bernie movement. Um, and and now, you know, we gotta we gotta go with what Debs did, and said, all right, this party doesn't seem like it's it's going to support the working class person. It's it's not going to support the the American people. So I'm going to go and uh, do something different. I'm going to have a different approach. Uh, so that was 1885. 1885. He said, I'm out, and he left. Um, he did a lot of organizing at that point. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and, uh, and if you, if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you, if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and uh, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do, and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.